God of glory, we pray that you would hear our prayer this morning. Grant to all of us a deep love for your word. Help us to see you in every passage. Let us feel your power of persuasion and conviction and transformation as we read and look into the Holy Word. Father, we praise you for your wisdom and for your faithfulness. You are God of covenant promise. And Father, your yes is always yes. And God, we thank you that you keep everything that you say you will do. You are God of integrity and righteousness and faithfulness and holiness, and we give you praise. And in this moment, I pray that you would remove all distractions, and God, that we would give you our undivided attention, and I pray that we would receive the Word of God as the Word of God this morning, and not as a word of man. May everything be done for the glory and the praise of your holy name, amen. I'd like to invite you to open your Bibles this morning to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11 as we continue to make our way through this wonderful uh, epistle. So Romans 11, we are going to look there at verse 11. So if you'll go ahead and find your place there, Romans 11, looking at verse 11. The, uh, the title of the message, if you pay attention, usually gives, you know, uh, it gives you an eye into the meaning of the passage. It should always do that. Uh, if you're going to title a sermon properly, it needs to reflect the passage that you're preaching. So the title for this morning's message is God's Redemptive Plan. So that gives you some insight into the meaning of the passage. When we read Romans 11, starting in there in, in verse 11... We are beginning to see the unfolding of God's redemptive plan, not just here in this moment, but how God has revealed His redemptive plan since the time of Genesis to where we are now in the book of Romans. God has always had a redemptive plan. There's never been a plan B or a plan C. There's always been plan A, even before the world was spoken into existence. From eternity when all that existed was God. In that moment, the triune Godhead had a redemptive plan before God ever said, let there be light. And so we will discuss some of that this morning. But let's go ahead and read about it now. So Romans chapter 11, uh, verse 11. Paul begins once again with this rhetorical question. He says, so I ask. Did they stumble in order that they might fall? In order to, you know, he's talking about the Jews. Did they stumble in order that they might fall? By no means. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion? mean. Now I'm speaking to you Gentiles inasmuch then as I'm an apostle to the Gentiles. I magnified my ministry, Paul says, in order that somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. For if their rejection means reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? If the dough offered has as first fruits is holy, so the whole lump, if the root is holy, so are the branches. But if some of the branches, now he starts in verse 17. Verse 17, he starts to give a warning, not to the Jews, but to the Gentiles. He says, but if some of the branches were broken off, and you, although a wild olive shoot, that's the Gentiles, you are grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing root of, of the olive tree. Do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember, it is not you who support the root, but the root supports you. Then you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. That is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief. But you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear, 
For if God did not spare the natural branches, Israel, neither will he spare you, Gentile. Note then the kindness and the severity of God. Severity toward those who have fallen, but kindness to you. Provided you continue in his kindness, otherwise you too will be cut off. There's the warning. And even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, they will be grafted back in, the Gentile, or the Jews. For God has the power to graft them in again. For if you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted contrary to the nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted back in into their own olive tree? Now let me just stop for a moment and we'll start reading here and again. Can I just tell you that the Apostle Paul and I have argued with one another all week. Now he won, of course. But uh, sometimes I, I was reading this passage numerous times over and over. And I'm like, Paul, just say it plain. You know, just say it plain like James does in the book of James. Just say it plain. And uh, if you know Paul that well, most of the time he doesn't just say it plain. He has this long theological argument that he builds and uh, you got to hang with him and understand the argument. And then eventually the, the, he brings the truth out uh, for us to see. And if you weren't confused just by reading that little bit that we just read, uh, I mean, olive trees and branches and cut off and grafted in and all this, you're, you'll be cut off to all this language of cutting off and grafting and... Uh, uh, this olive tree and this dough and this lump and all these different things. It can get confusing. But we pick up reading in verse 25 and he says, Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be under, unaware of this mystery. Well, thank you. Because I'd already discovered that it was a mystery. Paul says, I do not want you to be under, unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles have come in. Now, but let me just stop you right there. Paul does not explain what he means. He just says it. What does he mean by a partial hardening has happened over Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in? And in this way, all Israel will, will be saved. Now, I know what some of you think. I know what some of you think. I know what some of you have been taught. And we'll deal with that. I just want you to know it may not be as clear as you think it is. Because Paul talks about present tense and future tense. And he moves back and forth in these passages. Sometimes we just build our own end time conclusion. Uh, conclusion most of the time, it's not because of something we see in the Scripture. It's because what somebody taught us. And we fail to look at the tenses. Is he using future tense here? Is he using present tense here? And if he uses future tense here, then why is he using present tense here? And if he's using present, present tense, then why do I automatically conclude it's happening in the future? And I'll tell you a big thing that we do that we need to stop doing is every time we read a passage in the New Testament about that, that is quoted from the Old Testament about the coming of Jesus, let me say that again. Every time we read a New Testament passage that is quoted from the Old Testament about the coming of Jesus, what do we automatically think it refers to? Every time we think it's referring to the second coming. Can I remind you that in the Old Testament, the first coming hadn't even happened yet? So a lot of those passages that we interpret as the second coming are really about the first coming. We just assume they're about the second coming. And we forget all about the first coming. So let me ask you a question. Do you think all the passages in the Old Testament about the coming of the Messiah are about the, all about the second coming? Well, yes, pastor, except for those that talk about the Christmas story, you know. 
you got to remember that the first coming hadn't even taken place in the Old Testament. So some of the passages about the coming of Christ are about the first coming. Not all of them are about the second coming. I say that because now we come to verse 26 and he says, In this way all Israel will be saved. And then he quotes from the Old Testament. As it is written, a deliverer will come from Zion and he will establish un- and he will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them, and I will take away their sins. And most people, when they read that, they think, well, that's talking about the second coming. When Jesus comes back, all Israel's going to be saved. Well, it could mean that. But what if it meant the first coming? Just something to think about. We'll deal with it here in a moment. And then he says, as regards to the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, But as regards to election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers, for the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, so they too have been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also may receive mercy. That's a mouthful. For God has consigned all to disobedience that he might have mercy on all. Lord, help us. Now, I can remember when I was pastoring in southeastern Oklahoma, I had just conducted a funeral at the church, and uh, normally I drive out to the graveside on my own. I usually don't get in the processional and drive with the processional because I want to be there ahead of time just to make sure everything's ready for the family. So I usually drive out there ahead of time on my own after, as soon as the service is over. Um, and I, I had done this, and, and uh, the funeral home director was already out there. Of course, we were waiting on the flowers to be delivered and all those things before the family came. And the funeral home director said, hey, since we're out here and since we're waiting, can I ask you a question? And I said, go ahead. Now, you remember, I was probably about 27 at this time, 28. And uh, he said to me, he says, preacher, I understand why we need the New Testament. You know, it's all about Jesus. But I have yet to find anyone who could tell me. Now, what that means is he's probably never asked anybody, or if he did, he didn't like the answer. So he just says, I have yet to find anybody who can tell me why I need the Old Testament. Well, I know that that funeral home director is not alive anymore, but I promise you, even after the answer I gave him, he probably said to some other preacher, I've still yet to find somebody. (laughs) It's one thing to really want to know the answer. It's another thing to really not want to know the answer, but to act like you do. And that was this case. So I said to him, well, you really can't under the, understand the New Testament without the Old Testament, and you really can't appreciate what Christ did for you on the cross unless you first understand it in light of the Old Testament. You see, the Old Testament from Genesis to Revelation is the unfolding of God's redemptive plan that culminated in the coming of Jesus Christ. So to truly appreciate the coming of Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, you need to study the Old Testament. And you need to see how from the very beginning, after Adam and Eve sinned, that God had promised the Redeemer in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, known as the Proto-Euangelion. He says that there is the first pronouncement of the gospel, that there would be one who would come from the seed of the woman who had crushed the head of the serpent. And everything in the Old Testament is about the coming, is the fulfillment of that passage. For example, God said there would be one who would come from the, head of the, from the woman who would crush the head of the serpent. Well, God chose Abraham in order to bring that seed into the world. And from Abraham, God built a nation. And from that nation, the seed would come into the world. And from that nation, God chose a tribe, the tribe of Judah. And from that tribe, the seed that would crush the head of the serpent would come into the world. And from that tribe, God chose a king. And from that king, King David, the seed of the woman would come into the world. And from that king, God chose a family. Mary and Joseph. And from that family, the seed of that 
of that child would come into the world. We know that it did not come from the seed of Joseph, but through the lineage of Joseph, both sides. Matthew records one, Luke records another. But through both sides, through, through Mary and Joseph, the seed came into the world. So when you look at the Garden of Eden, God created the world, mankind fell, and God said there in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, from the seed of the woman, one would come who would crush the head of the serpent. And so we trace the seed from Abraham to Israel to Judah to David, and then ultimately to Mary and Joseph. And every Old Testament prophecy that is fulfilled in Christ, the sacrificial system was to point them to Jesus. The priests were to point them to the true priest. All the prophets were, was pointing them to the prophet. All the sacrifices was pointing them to the perfect sacrifice. All the kings they, were, they existed because they were pointing to the king. So everything in the Old Testament is the unfolding of God's redemptive plan that culminated in the coming of Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection on the cross in order to establish the church. And now we have a responsibility to proclaim God's redemptive plan to the world. I've still yet to find somebody who can explain to me why I need the Old Testament. Hmm. I say that to all of you because that is truly the, what we refer to as the, merit, the meta-narrative of Scripture. It's the main storyline of the Bible. Everything I just shared with you. We come to today's passage of Scripture and we see and we know that God has chosen the nation of Israel. We know that the, the nation of Israel, they are God's chosen people. But we know that the nation of Israel itself, national Israel, that within national Israel, there's a spiritual Israel. We've studied that through the book of Romans. Spiritual Israel is actually God's elect. Not national Israel, but, God's, but the spiritual Israel. Those whom God chosen himself before the foundation of the world. You know, God's remnant. But the nation as a whole, they've turned their back on God. They stumbled over the Messiah. So the question that we are going to answer today is, has their stumbling resulted in their ultimate falling away? Is God now done with Israel? Is he now finished with them? Does Israel's story that began so well, God choosing Abraham, building a nation, that ultimately gave birth to the Messiah... Does Israel's story that began so well ultimately end with destruction? Is that how their story ends? We're going to answer that question today. So look there in your Bibles. I know I've already said a lot. I've got to get going. Can I just tell you, starting in verse 11, we have a long argument. A long argument. This argument goes all the way through verse 32. There's a lot of pauses. There's breaks in this argument. But it is a single flow of thought. That's the reason I'm preaching verse 11 all the way through verse 32. Because it is a single flow of thought. It's an argument that's being laid out in front of us. Now, Paul starts this argument much like he did last week. With a rhetorical question. You remember chapter 11 verse 1. The rhetorical question that Paul asked. He said I asked then. Has God rejected his people? And then we have that emphatic response. By no means God has not rejected his people. But they stumbled. Do you remember? They stumbled over Jesus. And God gave them a spirit of stupor. Eyes that they couldn't see. And ears that they couldn't hear. As a matter of fact. The Bible says in verse 9 of chapter 11, And their table became a snare and a stumbling block and a retribution for them. So has God given them up totally because of their unbelief? So now we have a second rhetorical question in verse 11. So I ask, did they stumble in order that they might fall? They stumbled over the, over the Messiah. They rejected the Messiah because of unbelief. So is God now finished with them? Is God now done with them? Is this how Israel's history ends? That's the question that Paul's going to answer. I'm going to give you three things 
this morning. The first, I don't want to call it thing. That's not a good preaching. I wouldn't tell my preachers. Don't call your points things. So I'm going to share with you three interesting aspects (laughs) of God's redemptive plan. The first one is this, God's, great, God's redemptive plan is gracious. We refer to this as God's gracious plan. The redemptive plan of God is gracious. How is it gracious? I want you to see what God has done here. Notice the wisdom of God. Go back to verse 11. So I asked, did they stumble in order that they might fall? Rhetorical question. The emphatic response, by no means. Look at what God has done. Rather, that through their trespass, through their sin, through their unbelief, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make the Jews jealous. Listen, I don't want to belabor these points any longer than I have, but notice the wisdom of God here. God says, listen, my plan from the very beginning has always been gracious. My plan has been this, is that in light of the Jews' unbelief, I would save the Gentiles. But the purpose of saving the Gentiles is to save the Jews in order that I might save the Jews. So here's how it plays out. God chose Abraham and built this wonderful nation. And ultimately, all this culminated in the coming of the Messiah. And the Jews, what did they do? They rejected the Messiah, except for a chosen remnant. And because of their unbelief, the gospel now goes to who? The gospel now goes to the Gentiles. As a matter of fact, I could show you many passages of Scripture. Uh, Let me just read a few to you as you see this unfold in the book of Acts. For example, let me just read Acts chapter uh, 13, if you want to write these down. Acts chapter 13, starting in verse 44. He says, The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul. And they reviled him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first, the Jews, since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. You have rejected the gospel. You have reviled the gospel. You have rejected the Messiah. And now we are turning to the Gentiles. It was always a part of God's redemptive plan. If you look at chapter 18 of the book of Acts, 18 verse 5, when Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And again, in Acts chapter 28, Acts 28, verse 23, we read these words. And when, they had, uh, and when they had appointed a day for him, they came to him at his lodging in greater number. From morning until evening, he expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus. Both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. And some were convinced by what he said, but others disbelieved. And disagreeing among themselves, they departed after Paul had made one statement. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through Isaiah. And he quotes from Isaiah talking about, their blinded eyes and their foolish hearts. And then he says in verse 28, Therefore let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles and they will listen. It's God's redemptive plan. And notice that God's redemptive plan is so gracious. How so? Well, the nation of Israel as a whole 
walked in unbelief. So God sent the gospel to the Gentiles, and the Gentiles received it and believed it. And God's whole point in saving the Gentiles was to make the Jews jealous in order to bring them to salvation. God has been gracious from the very beginning. The Jews chose to reject. God took the gospel to the Gentiles in order to make the Jews jealous in order to save the Jews. And you're going to see how God does that here in just a little while. So we read on and and it says this. Now, in verse 12 of Romans 11. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their inclusion mean? So Paul's letting us know something. There is going to be a day when the gospel returns to the Jews. Now, the question is, is when does that happen? Of course, there are some believe that the fulfillment is an end-time prophecy. There are those who believe, and possibly they're right. However, I think we need to think deeply about this. There are some who believe that when Jesus Christ returns at the second coming, they believe that all the Jews living on the earth at that time will be converted. That's what they believe. They believe that this passage is talking about the second coming of Jesus, and when Jesus returns... National Israel will be saved. Um, I think that there's a better interpretation. And we'll get to that here in a moment. What we'll, but what we do see is this. If the, if the rejection of the Jews meant salvation for the Gentiles, then what is it going to mean for the world when the Jews are tur- when they turn back to Christ? Now, again, we know that he's not talking about the Jewish nation being saved. Because in order for us to say the Jewish nation is going to be saved, we'd have to throw out everything that Paul has said up to this point. Paul has been teaching us, starting in Romans 9, that there is a spiritual Israel within the nation. And the nation as a whole does not reflect God's chosen people. There's a true Israel and there's a... There's a spiritual Israel and there's a national Israel. The spiritual Israel, those are God, whom God chose in himself from the beginning, they are the remnant. So what you must believe in light of all of Paul's teaching is when he says that Israel will be saved, he's not talking about national Israel, he's talking about spiritual Israel, he's talking about the elect, he's talking about the remnant. We've just spent three chapters realizing that. So there is no reason for us to believe, according to the book of Romans, that there is coming a day when national Israel is going to turn to Christ. However, there will be a day when those whom God has chosen before the foundation of the world, God's elect in Israel, the remnant who will turn to Christ. And when they turn to Christ, the world will be blessed because of it. It will usher in some sense of a global revival. You say, Pastor, how do you say that? Well, the Bible says if their rejection meant salvation for the Gentiles, then what will their inclusion mean for the world? It's a positive connotation. The Jews coming to Christ, those the remnant who comes to Christ will mean blessings for the world. As I've told you before, I do believe that there will be trials and tribulation that increase in intensity until the coming of Jesus Christ. I believe that those trials and tribulation, the tribulation began at the ascension of Jesus and it has escalated all the way to to where we are today and it will continue to uh, escalate until Christ returns. But it doesn't negate the fact that it's very possible that God once again is going to send a national, perhaps even a global revival to the world. Preceding the coming of Jesus Christ. I believe it's a possibility. And I believe it's a possibility because of passages just like this. It's a part of God's gracious plan. 
He chose the nation of Israel. They rejected the Messiah. God sent the gospel to the Gentiles only to make the Jews jealous. The Jews are going to come back to Christ, that remnant whom God has chosen. And when it happens, it's going to mean blessings for the world. That's what we see here. Look at your Bibles. I'll show you again. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, the Gentiles, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, then how much will their inclusion mean? Greater blessing is what is implied. He says, now I am speaking to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles. Now, notice this. This is where we're going to have to think. Paul says, I magnify my ministry, present tense. Paul says, right now, I am magnifying my ministry. He's not bragging. He's saying, I'm giving full effort to my ministry. That's what he means here. I'm not playing around. I'm fervent in zeal. I'm not lacking in love. I'm not lagging behind. I'm giving full energy to my ministry. That's present tense. I magnify my ministry. Verse 14, in order that somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. Wait a minute, that's present tense. So here's where we're challenged. Some of you have been taught that this incoming of the Jews isn't going to happen until the second coming. Paul says, I magnify my ministry right now so that it happens right now. I magnify my ministry so that through my ministry, the Jews might be brought to jealousy in order to save some. Paul saw it happening even then in his ministry. Hmm. So I would suggest to you that the passage that says all Israel will be saved is a progressive act that is being carried out even in the days of the Apostle Paul and it is still being carried out in our day and will be fully realized at the second coming of Jesus. In other words, he says, when the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, all Israel will be saved. He's saying, when the fullness of the Gentile number is met, when the number of those whom God has chosen to be saved among the Gentiles, God has chosen a number, according to his divine sovereignty, he has chosen an elect people, and when the elect, when the number of the elect Gentiles has come in, then all Israel will be saved. Paul is saying that there happened simultaneously. The remnant of the Jews is being saved as the remnant of the Gentiles is being saved. And when the Gentile number is ultimately realized, the salvation of Israel will be realized. So what I'm telling you is this. Don't just interpret this as some end time national salvation of the national, nation of Israel that comes to fulfillment at the second coming of Jesus. Jesus comes back, Israel looks upon the Messiah, and the whole nation that's living on the earth converts to Christ. That's not how I see it. I see that as part of it. Not national Israel, though, because I'd have to throw out everything else Paul's been teaching. Spiritual Israel. So Paul is saying, I'm magnifying my ministry right now in order to stir the Jews to jealousy that I might save some. And we just read just a few moments ago that some of the Jews were what? They were convinced. Still to this day, there's a remnant of Jews who are being what? They're being convinced along with the Gentiles. The fullness of the Gentiles is coming in. And the remnant of the Israel is being brought in as well. The Gentiles 
are coming in, the Jews are coming in. The Gentiles are coming in, the Jews are coming in. The Gentiles are coming in, the Jews are coming in. It's corresponding. It's a corresponding salvation act of God that was carried out in the days of Paul and it is being carried out today and it will culminate at the coming of Jesus. And we're not talking about national salvation. We're talking about the bringing in of God's elect. The remnant. So you know what that means? That that blessing to the world that we just read about could happen at any moment. Now, if you interpret this to mean it only happens at the second coming. Jesus comes back, the Jews believe, and they're converted. Well, how is that a blessing to the world? Because when he comes back, he brings judgment upon the world. But if you read this as happening simultaneously, using the, listen, don't be looking at what somebody wrote in the study notes at the bottom of your Bible. Look at the verb tenses that are being used. If Paul saw it happening in his day, then we are probably good to assume that it's happening in our day. It's happening now. And one day, as it's being realized, it's going to result in what? Blessings to the whole world. So it's possible that there will be a great ingathering, a great soul's harvest, a great revival, perhaps even globally, preceding the coming of Jesus Christ. You say, well, I don't know. I think persecution is going to get worse and worse. Hmm. Every time I've studied persecution in the Bible, the church has grown. They're not exclusive. Revival and persecution go hand in hand. So we see here, he says, I magnify my ministry, verse 14, that I might save some of them. That's all present tense. Verse 15, for if their rejection means reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? If the dough offered as life from the dead, or I'm sorry, if the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so the whole lump, if the root is holy, so are the branches. And by the way, I'm going to share, now we move into verse 17, and we move from God's gracious plan to God's grave warning. We have a grave warning here. And I'm just going to, I want you to read this on your own, but there's, there's a couple of theological challenges you need to be challenged with today. There's some, there is some mistaken theology, I think, that needs to be corrected. When you read verse 17, for example, let me just read it. But if some of the branches were broken off, Israel, and by the way, not spiritual Israel, spiritual Israel was never broken off, were they? God never breaks off his elect. He never breaks off his remnant. So when the Bible says, but some of the branches were broken off, he's referring to national Israel. And you, the Gentiles, although a wild olive shoot, you were grafted in among the others. Ah, oh, among the others. You see that? Among the others. There's still some there. The remnant's still there. And now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree. How many trees are there? Is olive tree singular or plural? It's what? Oh, it's singular. Really? Then why do we act as if Israel and the church are two different groups? If there's only one olive tree. Well, God's got a special way He's going to save the Jews. That's different than from how He saves the Gentiles. You know, God's got a special covenant with the Jews. So they're going to come to Christ through the Old 
Old Testament covenant promise. We got to come to Christ through grace, by grace through faith in Jesus. There's, there's two different groups. There's the church and then there's the Jews. Uh, I, I, don't, I, I just read one olive tree here. Not two olive trees, one. And you're either in the olive tree or you're not. Again, what's the olive tree? Well, it's the, prom, it's the blessing of Abraham. It's the Abrahamic covenant, which we are now recipients of. We are grafted into that covenant. It's the covenant now. It's the covenant, the Abrahamic covenant that we are grafted into. It's the being a member of the patriarchs. He says, do not be arrogant toward the branches. You Gentiles, don't be arrogant. For you, for you remember, it is not you who support the root, but the root supports you. See, apparently the Gentiles were starting to get arrogant, and they were looking down their noses at the Jews. We're God's chosen people now. We are grafted into the covenant of Abraham, and you've been cut off. And God says, let me tell you something about your pride. You don't support the root. The root supports you. You don't support Israel. Israel supports you. The promise was first made to the Jews. So don't you look down your noses at the Jews and think you're better than them. If I cut them off because of their unbelief, then don't you think I won't cut you off because of your pride. Now that's a grave warning. Who did God cut off? God cut the unbelieving Jews off from the covenant promise. Because they were not spiritual Israel. They were not God's elect. And then he says to the Gentiles, I've grafted you in. You're the, you're the wild branch that's been grafted in. Who did he graft in? The elect Gentiles. Into the promise. Again, I'm just putting all this in context, right? And he says to the Gentiles, watch yourself. If you get prideful, I'll cut you off. Who will he cut off? Those who are a part of the Gentiles, but have never been converted. He said, I'll cut you off. You start getting prideful. Same thing he did to the Jews. Who did he cut off? He cut off the Jews that walked in unbelief. Well, who were they? Those who didn't receive the Messiah. Those, even though they were a part of the nation, they were lost. And now he's saying to the Gentiles, listen, you can be a part of the Gentiles. You can appear to be a part of the church. But if you get prideful and arrogant, I'll cut you off. A grave warning from a gracious God. And then notice what he goes on to say in verse uh, 23, of course. I'm sorry, look at verse 22. He's like, you need to meditate upon God's character. He says, note then the kindness and the severity of God. Severity toward those who have fallen. God will be severe with those who have fallen into unbelief and fallen into pride. But kindness to you, provided you continue in kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. And even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. So there will be some who appear to be cut off that will actually be grafted back in. Why? Because of faith in Christ. There's only one way to be saved, folks. And that's to trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. The Jews do not have a separate way of salvation than, than the rest of everybody. There's only one way to be saved, and that is by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. For if you were, for if what, if, for if you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted contrary... Then how much more will these natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? God says, listen, even though the Jews appear to be cut off, 
If they turn to Christ, they'll be grafted back in. Well, who's he talking about? Who are those grafted by, back in? The elect remnant from spiritual Israel. He says they'll be grafted back in. So right now, God is saving an elect Gentile, a remnant. And alongside them, he is, a, he is saving an elect Jews, a remnant. One tree, one church, one Lord, one baptism. And in order to be a part of that olive tree, you've got to come to faith in Jesus Christ as the Messiah. What's the mystery? The mystery is that the two have now become one. The church. So I leave you with God's glorious mystery. Verse 25. Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of the mystery. That a partial hardening. God hasn't done away with them. It's a partial hardening. That has happened until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. And then all Israel will be saved. I've already preached this. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. First coming or second coming? If you believe it started at the first coming of Christ, they rejected, but eventually, through the ministry of the Apostle Paul, the Gentiles were being saved. The Jews were turned to jealousy. They started to be converted. Ultimately, this... This finds its fulfillment where? It finds its fulfillment at the second coming. My point is, is we're not waiting on the second coming for it to happen. (laughs) It's happening now. So, as regards to the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But as regards to election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. And the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. God says, listen, I've chosen them for the foundation of the world, spiritual Israel. And my choosing of them is irrevocable. If I chose them before the foundation of the world to be saved, they'll come to Jesus. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you were one time disobedient to God, but you have received mercy because of their disobedience, so too... So too they have been disobedient in order that they may be shown mercy. For God has consigned to all disobedience that he might have mercy on all. So in this passage we see the glorious plan of God. The grave warning of God. And the glorious mystery of God. So I conclude with this. What is the application? Number one. And I'm just going to share one aspect of this. I have two aspects. I'm going to share one with you. By way of wisdom, number one, we should have compassion for the Jewish people. Number two, we should pray for the salvation of the Jewish people. And then number three, we should labor for the conversion of the Jewish people. I'm going to ask you, if you would, to bow your heads with me this morning. And my question to you personally is quite simple. Is where do you fit into God's redemptive plan? Which side of redemption are you on? Are you walking in unbelief? Is there a partial hardening of your heart? Have you failed to come to Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? I would say to you that in order for you to be saved, you must be grafted into the olive tree. And the only way to be grafted in is to come to faith in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. So here in a moment, when I ask you to stand, for those of you who need to be saved, would you walk up to myself or Jerry and let us pray with you? And then for the church, listen, don't be arrogant. We are who we are by grace. We were wild olive tree branches and we were grafted in 
to the covenant promise of Abraham by grace through faith in Jesus Christ and all this by the grace of God so therefore be warned your heart can be deceitfully deceptive be warned don't be prideful don't be arrogant be warned embrace the mystery there's one people of God there's the church and we are all one family and look with anticipation that there might be a great revival coming soon. Would you ask the Lord to give you compassion for the Jews? Would you pray for their salvation? And would you ask God how He might would use us as a church to labor for their souls? Father God, we commit this time to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you stand and come as the Lord leads?